Radical inclusion was not a mark of the first churches, it became the mark of the first churches. Now, our greatest challenge is to work out and then to apply what this means for our local churches today. I posted that tweet last week. Sorry, came one reply, but where does the New Testament say that? Well, it's a good question. And it's one that I intend to address head on over the next couple of weeks. But today I want to begin by looking at the principle of radical inclusion in the Old Testament. Because the way I see it, inclusion is one of the biggest, though often ignored and even denied themes that runs right through the whole Bible. Although the phrase never occurs itself, the notion of radical inclusion is, to my mind, embedded in Hebrew thought within the biblical record from Genesis onwards. The founding father of the ancient people of Israel was Abraham, and although the Bible says nothing about his early life, there's an old story about these early years which is still taught by Jewish rabbis around the world today. It's also found in the Book of Jubilees, an ancient Jewish commentary on Genesis and part of Exodus, which was written around 150 to 100 BC. The story explains that Abraham's father, Terah, was an idol maker in the city of Ur in southern Mesopotamia, and modern day Iraq. Now this was a good business because the ancient peoples had lots and lots of local and tribal gods that they wanted to worship the god of the sun, of the wind, the god of the river, the rain, the soil, the harvest, the god of their country, the god of their tribe, etc. And the idea was to keep all of these gods happy and then you'd be prosperous. However, Terah's three thinking son, Abraham, soon began to question the reality of all these idols. Logically, as far as he could see, there could only be one god, not many. So finally, as a young man, he eventually summoned the courage to confront his dad, Terah, about all of this. One fateful day, he deliberately smashed, broke all of his father's idols, except one of them, before calling his family and the wider community to abandon their a local god for every situation and every occasion approach to life and choose instead to worship the one true god, the god of the whole world, of everything and of everyone. But things backfired, and as a reward for his boldness, Abraham found himself condemned by Nimrod, the king, and thrown into a furnace. Miraculously, however, he escaped unharmed. So, decades later, as the book of Genesis records in chapter 12, when Abraham was an old man, this one God of everything and everyone sets a challenge and makes a promise to him. Go from your country, your people and your father's household to a land that I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Right from the start, however, as we can see, God's intention is clearly that the generosity shown to Abraham should be shared universally. And so he adds, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham makes the choice to begin the journey of a lifetime with this God of everyone and everything. And I've always loved the statement that follows, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And in doing so, of course, he becomes the father of what we now call monotheism, the belief in the existence of one God the God of everyone and everything, the God of the universe, as opposed to polytheism, which was about the worship of many local and tribal gods. The challenge to Abraham and Sarai, his wife, was to find the courage to leave behind the cultural box that had confined them all of their lives, to venture out and to trust the one true God, the God of everyone, to lead them. Did this stretch them? Of course. Did this scare them? Without doubt. But did it diminish them? No. Instead, it set them free. Nonetheless, still today, this journey, the one through which all peoples on earth will be blessed, is far from complete. 
The challenge that posed itself to Abraham and Sarai back in the Mesopotamian Bronze Age still confronts each one of us today. Do we have the courage to leave behind the confines of the religious and cultural boxes that we've leave, lived in? Are we ready to work for a world where the excluded are welcomed, the broken are restored, the hungry are fed, where difference and diversity are celebrated, where injustice is banished and no one is oppressed? Some call all of this idealistic nonsense. Jesus called it the kingdom of God and he taught that the work of his church was to bring it into being. Fifteen years ago I became the leader of Christ Church in Upton Chapel in London which is now known as Oasis Church Waterloo. Its building was open just one day a week, one hour a week with a small but committed congregation. Its centrepiece was a large wooden pulpit that had been preached in almost every Sunday since June 1783. But the problem was that it and some pews were now in the way of opening up the building to the whole community. It was a contentious issue, but that small group of members, some of whom had been part of the church for 50 years, were willing to sacrifice the tradition and history represented by their pulpit and pews and together we made the decision to remove them. Months later, because of this decision, we were able to open a coffee shop and soon, because of the people that we met through it, various other community initiatives followed. Today, at least a thousand people every day come through the building and the church, still at its centre, is now healthy, thriving, diverse and constantly growing. God is not behind us back there in the past somewhere endlessly trying to get us to return to how things used to be. Instead God is ahead of us, pulling us forwards towards a better, more inspiring vision for our future than we might ever otherwise been able to imagine. What do you think about all of this? Do you agree with me or do you see things differently? How good is your church at finding the courage to leave its cultural box? at straying away from its comfort zones. Which groups of people in your local community might feel right now that the God of Christianity is a tribal God and isn't interested in them? What can you do to remove these barriers? Next week, I'll be exploring how the New Testament builds in a very deliberate sense on this story of radical inclusion and I'll also be unveiling Oasis next major contribution to the inclusion debate. Watch this space. I'll see you next week.